Hi, everyone, and welcome to lecture five of ECE 3311, Principles of Communication Systems. Um, this lecture, uh, what we're going to be focusing on is the concept of digital signaling, right? So in lecture four, uh, what we saw was this idea of taking an analog waveform, sampling it, um, in particular, using pulse code module, coded modulation, um, communicate it as a series of bits, and then from those bits, recover the original analog waveform, right? In this lecture, we're going to look at explicitly when the analog waveform uh, very visibly contains the digital information we want to convey. So it's, 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 a diff it's different. Um, so, so how so? So in lecture four, we had an analog waveform. We represented it as binary information. And then from the binary information, we reconstructed the analog waveform. In this lecture, the analog waveform contains the binary information like right off the bat, right? And that's what we send to the receiver, okay? So this lecture is very important because a lot of like the baseband type of communications that we're gonna be looking at later in this course um, really base themselves on this particular lecture. So let's begin. So first of all, uh, the analog waveforms cab, no what, no. Analog waveforms can be represented as this thing. And you might say, what the heck is that thing? Okay, so what that thing is, right? So we have W of T, okay? And W of T um, is specified from zero to T. Okay, so it's, a, it's like so. And then what happens is uh, we represent uh, it as a summation of uh, these weights, WK, multiplied by phi K of T, okay? And what the heck are these phi K of T? So there's a typo here. At the bottom, it says orthogonal basis function. That is not correct. It's orthonormal basis functions, right? Very, very big difference, and I'll explain in a minute. In fact, let me explain now. So let me draw this. So what happens is we could represent, suppose I have some sort of waveform. Let's say that's my W of T, right? And so, and then that is with some, uh, across some period of time. T naught. So what happens is I could represent that W of T in terms of this. Do, do, do. Let's make sure my notation is correct. K is equal to one to N. W of K. And then this, very important, yep, and this from zero to T naught. So very important things, this is my orthonormal basis function, FCN is function. And this are my weights, okay? So what this effectively does, another way of looking at it, is this sugar loaf like waveform here. Suppose I have phi one of T and it looks like this. Uh, phi two of t, and it looks like that. And I have phi three of t, and maybe it looks like this. Uh, 
all the way to phi n of t. Okay? And this is with respect to time. All of these are. What this ex that expression means is that I could take W of t and decompose it as a weighted sum of each one of these. Now, very important, really important. Remember, this waveform, okay, okay, um, like, uh, like I will have a different waveform, let's say, uh, repre representing different type of data, right? So let's say I have, I have, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have W1 of T, W2 of T. W3 of T. What this means is I'm going to have W11 phi1 of T plus W12 phi2 of T plus all the way to W1n phi n of t. Then 2, 1. Then 2, 2. Then 2n. Then 3, 1. 3, 2, 3, N. What's important to notice, different weights but the basis, func basis functions, the orthonormal basis functions are the same. Right? So that's actually really important. So what this means is that all I need are the same n basis functions. I can create any one of the allowable waveforms that can be communicated from the transmitter. And my receiver is aware of that as well for decoding any intercepted signal, right? So this is actually really, really super duper important. So before we go any further, let me emphasize, so what does orthonormal basis function mean? Orthonormal. Function, FCM. What this means, is if I take a basis function and I multiply it with another basis function, complex conjugate. So what happens when things are orthogonal with each other, right? They, like think of this integral here, okay? And this operation or the product of these two as some form of projection. Better yet, what projects in the linear algebra world? A dot product. So what we're doing is we're trying to project, we're trying to see how similar, how much correlation exists between phi k of t and phi j complex conjugate t. If they're orthogonal to each other, what does that mean? They don't project. 
So it should be when the K and J are not equal, should be zero. What happens if J and K are identical? If they're orthogonal, the result of the product of these two ortho uh, the product of these two functions, and then integrated over a period t naught, should be equal to some constant. Orthonormal, orthonormal, should be equal to one. Super important. So as an aside. Try this out. Ah. <laughs> That's those are going to be orthonormal. Also, uh, what's a kind of interesting is these coefficients, right? These W of I's. How are we getting these suckers? We're doing this. Right? And we take WT. So again, what does this integral expression do? It projects W of T onto this guy, correct? It's a dot product. So that's actually pretty important. So, so the way to look at this I'm not sure if it's correct. Like, I'm not sure if you go around and say, this is how you look at it. But the way to think about it is just like your x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, right? And you have a vector. And instead of x, y, z, and oh yeah, by the way, you probably saw this when you were a kid. What's the, like, you know, so x, What's the orthonormal basis functions? I hat, J hat, and K hat. Correct? Yeah. 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 So what do we do? We take W of T and we project onto, let's say this is orthonormal basis function three and orthonormal basis function two and orthonormal basis function one. So this distance here would be W3. This distance here would be W2. And that distance here, that would be W1. Okay, so when we go back to this representation here, what we're effectively doing is we're taking d W1 of t and decomposing it into n-dimensional space where it's represented by these n orthonormal basis functions that are weighted and summed together. So that's how you should be visualizing that's how you should be visualizing this. Okay? And what's really cool, one of the reasons why we do this is that it kind of simplifies life. Actually it simplifies it a ton because at the transmitter receiver, 
what we do is we don't we don't need to write out the entire time domain waveform if we have a standard set of orthonormal basis functions all we need are the weights that communicate between each other like you know so at the receiver it's like oh i received this waveform and consists of w1 w2 all the way to wn because the orthonormal basis functions are known and they don't change yeah okay so that's what i just showed like in terms of the vector space let me redraw it in a nicer way because i am not content So what it would look like is something like this. Instead of X, Y, Z, and then this guy here, this W of T would actually be, a, would the, the head of that vector would have the coordinates W1, W2, W3. So W1, W2, and W3. right so that's the this is our signal space model okay so you'll see a lot of this we do actually quite a bit of this in ece 4305 uh, the reason for that is um, if you design transmitters and receivers especially when you're trying to decode waveforms, it gets really boring, at, well, not boring, tedious after a while doing over and over and over again, a whole bunch of integrals and trig identities and all that jazz. But imagine the signal space model again, this fella, right? Uh, yep. Okay. Is instead represented by a dot product. A lot easier than the messy integral. Okay. All right. So now, um, what we want to do is some basic definitions. So that's the first thing, is uh, signal space representations, right? So you should just be aware that there are ways that I could represent a waveform in the time domain. And you might say, okay, okay, Wiglinski, so what? Well, uh, like, where would we be using this? Okay, so before I even go there. Uh, because may maybe it's, okay, so we have the signal space representation. Uh, how do we apply it? This is how you apply it. I, I, I just want to make sure. What would happen is, hmm, let's do this. Let's, let, I'm just going to keep things like this. So let's say that and it and it. Um, let's say you have did, did, um, did, did, and then you have some slant thing, and then you have this again. So let's say that's waveform WT1, and it possesses some amount of information. Uh, this is uh, WT2, uh, just for, that's WT1 again. Uh, let's say that's W3. Uh, this fella here is, W4 of T, W5 of T, uh, W6 of T. And what happens is, if you notice, is that it's every T seconds. 
correct? Boop, boop, boop. What the transmitters and what the transmitters and receivers will do is they will decompose each one of these. into that vector I was telling you about. Okay, so every T seconds, you have another vector, another vector, another vector, another vector. And then that vector goes into the decision-making process as to determining which one of these waveforms are sent. Why? Because you can actually potentially, so what happens is in reality, so let's, let's do 2D, let's keep it simple. So suppose I transmit this, that's my vector. And it's represented by W11, W12. What happens is noise, right? Unwanted signals between the transmitter and receiver occurs and it distorts that waveform. What it, and what it will do, and, and again, you'll be seeing this a lot in 4305, it moves the vector. So that noise signal moves it such that the receive signal actually looks like this. So that's what your receive signal looks like. Now, what happens is suppose there's only two waveforms that this could possibly be. Like your receiver is only expecting either W1 or W2. So what happens is your receiver will do a process every T seconds that calculates something called Euclidean distance. It knows what W2 should look like. It knows what W1 should look like, but it got R. So which one's closer? Is W2 closer to R or is W1 closer to R? That's why in many ways, we do this sort of um, this uh, this uh, sort of signal space representation because it makes the representation and the calculation Euclidean distance a lot easier. Additionally, when we go into the concept of calculating the bit error rate, we often use the signal space representation to to help us derive it. Okay, so again, that's more 4305 material, but again, you should be uh, aware of where this is coming from and where it's going. Now. Just some standard definitions, baud rate, bit rate, and bandwidth. So baud rate is symbol rate, right? So if you have N symbols occurring during a duration T naught or N samples, okay? And each sample is represented by a bunch of bits, right? But you have N samples across a time interval T naught it's n samples or n symbols per second. Bit rate, if let's say each one of those symbols is represented by a bunch of bits, okay? Or in other words, if we have n bits occurring across that time interval T naught, we have the bit rate or bits per second. And the two are different, right? So if let's say we had two bits for every symbol, our bit rate would be two big N divided by T naught. And then finally bandwidth, which is gonna be equal to one over two times D, the symbol rate. Okay, so binary signaling versus multi-level signaling. So what happens is uh, what we could do in terms of digital signaling. So let's look at like amplitude, amplitude signaling.
what happens is if you have binary signaling, what happens is, is that effectively um, you're either communicating either a one or a zero. So over the, uh, you know, the period, right, symbol period, you're communicating only one bit of information. And therefore, you really only need one amplitude value or one frequency value or one phase value representing one bit, either a one or a zero, and then another value in order to calculate the other bit, okay? So let's say we do amplitudes. Let's say, a, okay, amplitude value A, I don't like the quotes, should be around the bit. So let's say binary one is represented by plus A value. And let's say a binary zero is represented by zero value. You're gonna get something like this across the time domain, every T seconds. You're going to get something like, so let's say I transmitted one, zero, zero, one. That's the binary information. What I'm going to have is plus A, zero, zero, plus A. Okay? Multi level, on the other hand, is different. So, multi level. Okay. Multi-level signaling, where are we? Here we go. So suppose I transmit two bits for every T seconds. So that means I have zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. So suppose that's zero, that could be plus A, plus two A, plus three A. So what this means is let's say zero T, two T, 3T, 4T. And suppose I'm communicating now, instead of just one bit, it's 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and then 1, 1 again. What does that look like? Zero amplitude value, all of a sudden shoots up to 3A. 0, 1 means I now go down to A. And now 1, 1 again, 3A. So what, what happens is in multi-level signaling, so in all of these cases, what I'm doing is I'm taking binary information and I'm translating it into a waveform and I'm using the physical properties of that waveform, the amplitude. We haven't looked at phase or frequency, but it's the same concept. I'm manipulating these parameters that represent these waveforms based on the bi these binary digits that map directly to it, okay? So that's how you do the multi-level signaling. So, so really the punchline here is that I could use amplitude, phase, frequency. And I can basically manipulate those based on the binary data. Okay. And in the case of multi-level signaling, I take groups of binary data and I make sure that I have the appropriate known mapping of both the transmitter and receiver in order to encode and decode that information. Okay. So, um, so one thing that comes up is this thing called the sync pulse. And this is a nice 
nice waveform you're going to see over and over and over again the rest of your communication lives. So what the sync pulse does is it's, it, it has some really good properties you're going to discover again later on, a little bit in this course, but a lot more in 4305 um, because it's a Nyquist pulse. It has some really nice properties. So let me show you what those properties are okay, by, by drawing them. So what happens is, I don't know why that does that. This is what happens. So suppose I want to communicate information, okay? I want to convert from the binary world to the analog world. How do I do that? So what happens is, first of all, I have binary information. Okay, so suppose I have that mapping thing again, right? Zero, 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 one, 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 zero. And that is equal to zero, A, two, A, three, A, just, just for fun. That's my mapping. So what do I have? So what's zero, one, three, A? What's one, one, two, A? What's zero, one, three, A? What's one, one, two, A? What's zero, one, three, A? What's one, zero, three, A, and then zero, 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 right? Now, what I do is I superimpose. So what happens is every T seconds, I take the amplitude value from those binary mappings and I multiply it against what we call an impulse ring. All right. So what I do is I take the impulse train and then I assign every one of those amplitude values to this. And I feed that into something called a pulse shaping filter. What happens when you feed an impulse like a delta into a pul uh, into something like an H of T, you get the impulse response at the output, right? That's why you call it an impulse, and an impulse response. Now, what happens if you have a linear combination of time-shifted impulses going into a system H of T? You get a linear combination of time-shifted impulse responses at the output. That's so beautiful. And if they all have different amplitude values, right? So these are the original impulses. They all have an amplitude value of one. Reality is once I multiply against the amplitude, what do I get? 3A, 2A. 3A, 2A. And then three, uh, 3A, 2A, 3A, 2A, 3A. We have one more 3A and then we have zero, right? What we should get out here are, is going to be a train of shifted H of T's, each one of them with a height corresponding to whatever it is on that specific impulse. So what we do, the most one of the very popular H of T's is, let me make sure I got the right expression, is the sync pulse, right? 
So that's often what we use for the pulse shaping filter. Actually, no, I take it back. We don't use a sync pulse for a pulse shaping filter. Ideally, it's great. In practice, it isn't because the sync pulse goes from minus infinity to infinity. We cannot define filters like that in real systems. You can't do it. It's not practical. You cannot define an infinitely long um, uh, impulse response uh, of a filter in, in your communication system. It's going to use up infinite amount of memory, and that's not, that, that's not, not doable. So what this is going to look like, this fella here in the time domain is this. There's a reason why sync pulses are really awesome. <sighs> Let me redraw that. It's these. The zero crossings. The zero crossings occur at the same sampling instances, okay, and multiple zero of, except at the origin. So you might say, okay, so what, Wiglinski? Don't care. This is why you should care. So let's go back to our delta train. We have a 3a at zero. We have a 2a at t. We have a 3a at 2t. We have a 2a at 3t. We have a 3a at 4t. We have a 3a at 5t. And we have a zero at 6t. What is this going to look like? This is what's going to look like once you pass it through a sync impulse response. It's going to look like this. It's, it's going to be kind of complicated, so brace yourselves. So you have 0, t, 2t, 3t, 4t, 5t, 6t. So let me draw the first few. So this here is going to have an amplitude of 3a. Okay. The next one is 2a. The next one is 3a again. The next one is 2a again. Uh, yeah, there we go. Ugh, shucks. And so on and so forth. So very important. There is one really, 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 really important thing you need to pay attention to here. Uh, let's use green. We haven't used green. Sample, sample, sample. Sample. Those are the desired samples, right? Remember, we're sampling. So everything in between 
one T, two T, three T, four T, five T, six T, seven T, doesn't matter. We throw that away. What's really interesting is that other than the desired sample occurring here, 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 and here, everything else is a zero crossing. So theoretically, 3A here will experience nothing. Like, check it out. The black curve here, zero crossing. The brown curve, zero crossing. Blue curve, zero crossing. It's perfect. So we can add this all together to get this composite waveform. So 3T, uh, sorry, 3A, 2A, 3A, 2A, 3A, 3A. And it'll look like this. Actually, it shoots down, but... And what happens is if you throw away the rest of stuff in between those desired samples, it does, it, you get exactly 3A, exactly 2A, exactly 3A, exactly 2A, and 3A, and 3A, and then if we go to 6T, this should go down, right? To zero. So beautiful property of the sync pulse when designed correctly. Very super duper happy, right? But there are some problems with the sync pulse, but that's for another time, okay? So in this lecture, so wait, before I end, again, super important property, H of T is equal to sync pi T of T, for a transform representation, H of F, it's equal to T over pi rectangular pulse in the frequency domain to TF, okay? Just be mindful of that. So this looks like what I just drew. So zero, T, two T, three T, minus T, minus 2t, so on and so forth. It's for a representation, looks like this, minus one over 2t and one over 2t centered at zero, okay? So that is pretty, pretty darn awesome. So that's how, so one thing also, and uh, we'll learn a little bit in this class, is at the receiver, Imagine if you don't sample correctly. If you sample here, sample here, sample here periodically, and you don't get quite the right sample, you don't get quite the same value. So you're getting, that's one of the major issues with communication systems, wireless communication systems in particular, is knowing where to sample properly your analog waveform, because otherwise bad things happen. You don't get the right value, and it could be quite drastic. Okay, so what, we, what did we see in this lecture? We saw a little bit about the signal space concept, okay, orthonormal basis functions. We looked at both binary signaling and multi-level signaling, but very importantly, we saw this thing about sync pulse shaping and how it can be used in order to take, let's say, digital data mapped to an amplitude value, applied to an impulse train, and then fed through a sync pulse shaping filter to produce a train of sync pulses that are superimposed on top of each other. But because of the sync property of at the desired sampling instant, it's not zero. And every other multiple of that sampling instant, it is zero. We get these beautiful properties in terms of no contributions from any of the other summed sync pulses. 
So with that, that concludes lecture five.